Hey everybody, so I have just recorded with Philip Rossmayer from Fitfile. And Fitfile is a health tech company looking to unify data all across healthcare and make it usable for life science organizations, NHS organizations, anybody in planning, care, or research, essentially. I made so many notes when I talked to Philip. It was just one of those conversations that, uh, yeah, just made me think quite a lot about healthcare. I think I mentioned this at the start that digital health, I think at the minute, is in a an interesting spot. You've got point solutions like digital therapeutics and things that can go in and solve a problem with a technology and all these technology bits. But there's also infrastructure change that can allow everything to become more digital. And I think, you know, that's what Fitfile are really involved in. They're involved in making everything interoperable. They're involved in making everything private and appropriately private with anonymization and pseudonymization, which Philip talks about. But really, it's all about getting data that's in hospital records and patient reported outcomes and blood results and activity metrics and all these different data points that exist about you and your health, but also organizational level, and actually making sure that the right people have access to that in order to make significant changes to healthcare talks about a project that they've done with St. George's and gastroenterology, talks about um, other life science companies as well and industry that could obviously use this to do different things. But it's it's all about getting the right information to the right people to make healthcare truly digital and um, make changes based on this incredible longitudinal data that they can put together. It's a, it's a really interesting chat the beginning actually when we talk about philip and his background you can see if you're watching this on youtube you can see the the joy that goes across philip's face when he talks about high performance and we touch on this where he's talking about the high performance of people and individuals his own family and he gets frustrated when he doesn't his own kids aren't you know, high performance when they could have all this potential he might be joking in that bit but um the point is it's a it's it's a really important part that makes him who he is and he sees the link to organizations being high performance the data and that makes loads of sense because in healthcare there is just so much data that goes uncollected that actually if we had access to it it was collected in the right way and structured and labeled and all of this and accurate then we could make these incredible decisions about populations and healthcare organizations can make incredible decisions about all their populations and we can actually get to a point of becoming more digital in the way that we do things. And actually, um, he's got a really interesting background, actually from oil and gas to investment banking and private equity. So really understands finance, really understands commercialization and how you make money and turn that into value and bringing that expertise into healthcare. Remember Kaylee Hartigan from a few episodes ago did exactly the same thing coming from that world and understanding the commercial the commercialization of things means you can really make a difference. Um, so yeah, it's a really interesting discussion. I uh, hope you enjoy it. So Philip, welcome to the Health Tech Podcast. How are you doing? I'm great. Thank you, James, for having me. It's very exciting. You're very welcome. You're very welcome. Yeah, looking forward to having you on. It's uh, We're going to cover some interesting stuff, I think. Everything you're doing at Fitfile, super interesting. Lots of well, you'd probably call it the more boring stuff, but actually one reflection I've had, and I spoke to the team about this this morning, is that digital health, I think, is just going through this really interesting patch. You look at like the digital therapeutics companies like Pair Therapeutics going under and all these sort of things that sit into healthcare as it is currently, which aren't bedding. They're not they're not coming in. They're not. They're not sticking around. And actually, there's this. There's a huge piece at the minute. I think of these like infrastructure changes. These things that are going to allow healthcare to become digital. The people that are already working in healthcare doing things that are now on digital rather than analog. So rather than these digital health things coming in, it just feels to me like there's these more infrastructure things going on, which is an incredibly reductive way to describe what you do. And I'm going to give you the chance to explain how you do that a lot more beautifully than I've just done. But I think this is far more in that category of like utility and just allowing the system to become digital and allowing people and in, in like, yeah, just allowing people to, to, to become digital in what they do. And I think that's going to be the real big gains in digital health. And so how we think about digital health, I think is changing, but 
I, I digress already. I should ask you, how, how are you? Where are you speaking to us from today, Philip? I, I don't think you digress. Um, I, I think you're right. I think data and I think um, actually having the right setup for some of these newer ways of doing things to uh, to be adopted at scale is something mm. that people are finally mm. getting their heads around in the UK and across Europe. But I'm great today. Thank you for asking. Uh, I am speaking to you from uh, one of our virtual locations, which are everywhere and nowhere. So I'm actually in my home in Weybridge. And as I speak, we've got people across the UK and indeed in parts of Europe and even uh, further uh, in Asia working on all things Fitfile. So we are uh, embracing this modern way of being. We get together quite often, um, typically in London uh, for those that can make it, but, uh, but also in other parts of the world. And that's how we make sure we have access to the best possible talent to do what we need to do. I'm looking forward to chatting, man, because as I say, there's there's a lot to talk about here. And I think it I think it's a really important time for healthcare where we are going through these infrastructure changes to become more digital. I think you're gonna be a really a really interesting player in it. So um before we talk about Fitfile and that stuff more generally, how about you tell us about you? You tell us your story. How did you come to be the founder and the CEO of Fitfile. Always happy to talk about myself, James. <laughs> and uh, I know we have a lot of time planned, so that's going to be easy. Um, I actually started my career in oil and gas with Shell in the 1990s, which is quite a long time ago now. Um, and I actually really enjoyed that. Uh, I'm not sure I'm allowed to say that, um, but what I really liked uh, uh, was working with smart people um, you know, we were in the scenario planning team, thinking hard about the future, uh, challenging actually the senior leaders across the group on how renewables uh, would be able to help one day, how an oil major like Shell, which in, in many ways itself felt like a super tanker on a, on a particular course, could evolve to to really tap into and, and and make that the best possible future. Th those were genuinely the kinds of conversations that we were having within that organization at a time when often it was in the news uh, for, for some of the, the less easy to navigate and, and manage aspects around extracting oil and gas. So I, I found that invaluable in terms of not only how, how do you, how do you manage such complex situations where on the one hand you are, an essential part of, of an e economy and, and a global economy functioning. On the other hand, doing things that quite rightly people were worried about for the sustainability of the planet and mankind. But actually, what I really learned out of that time was how can you take all available data to work out the best course of action uh, that was was most likely to, to kind of uh, uh, result in long-term sustainable success? So I, I did that for a while, but it, you know, it, it was fairly slow moving uh, back then. And, uh, and I decided that I needed something very fast paced and, and kind of uh, uh, much more sort of on the finance end of the spectrum, which is, which is why I spent some years in, in investment banking at Morgan Stanley uh, initially. Um, uh, I, I was very briefly at UBS as well in equity capital markets. And then I did m and I did kind of capital raisings and so forth. Um, and what, that period taught me, um, more than anything else, I think, was that getting deep into subject matter really, really pays off when you are kind of really trying to make a difference. So, you know, even as a, as a banker, and again, not, not always the most loved of sectors, but um, if you want to build close relationships and, and you want to get the trust of your, of your customers, you have to invest enough time into understanding their businesses, understanding how they think. And, and that was something which, which stuck with me from that period. Uh, because if you do that, it's not so much about the numbers. It's really much more about the people and, and, and how do you connect with those people and how do you help them and their organizations. So, so I think through that process, actually, James, I realized that what I really enjoyed the most was understanding how organizations work and how teams within those organizations make things happen. Uh, you know, there, there were a lot of my colleagues that I used to work with um, around, for example, bottoming out 
synergies in, in, in mergers and acquisitions. And, and I used to take it about as far as anybody would, I think, in, t- in terms of really understanding, would that be uh, reasonable to achieve? What would the combined entity look like? And I, I, I decided that the best way for me to, to kind of go properly long into that was to move into private equity, because I really wanted to get closer to the businesses themselves. Uh, that is, um, you know, very, uh, a very interesting place to be when you don't just give advice, but you have to live with your decisions for a number of years once you've made an investment. <laughs> uh, and I think in in those in those cases, uh, as you and I have discussed before, it's really really critical to uh, make sure that the right professionals are in the right roles, that they're incentivized to achieve collective success. And you know what that helped me realize was that whilst in the kind of microeconomics textbooks that I used to uh, uh, be made to read, uh, they talk <laughs> about companies being the nexus of contracts. You know, for me, no way, right? Yes, that's part of it. But really what it's all about is 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 a collection of individuals. And, and they may be fallible. They may be prone to ups and downs. I think all of us are. But they're also capable of extraordinary success and that's something which i i loved so very much when when i was in a in a growth capital investor role the, the businesses that we backed were full of these uh often colorful mercurial people who were passionate believers in what they were achieving uh and they and they managed to bring around them groups of people that that they would then feed off as well. It was like a mutual, uh, you know, like a mutual sort of energy providing sort of setup. Uh, and when you saw that, um, and and you know, I was lucky enough uh, to to have seen from 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 greater and lesser distances some really really impressive companies growing extremely quickly and doing things that I think genuinely uh, delighted their customers. So I, I really love that part of my career. I want to ask you something here because. It's it's funny actually that you're go you're you're sort of going the wrong way. You're going from investment banking to PE, and we're gonna we're gonna go down into into startups soon, which is often often backwards of the route that people want to go. <laughs> especially especially if you're investing, you want to go the other way. Um, but obviously, the rewards uh, the rewards can be made or, or can be achieved anywhere. But what I want to actually ask you about is that. For those for those people that are watching this on YouTube, uh, sadly for people that are listening won't have seen it, but there was a, a big smile that went across your face when you started talking about this synergy of people with all their imperfections leading to success. Now, you've obviously done this well because you've 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 obviously managed teams for investment banks and private equity so far in your journey, and I'm sure we'll talk about the Fitfile and startups later, but. I, I'm interested, what do you think is the role of a leader in fostering that and encouraging that? I, I, I ask this question selfishly as a, as a CEO, as a co-founder, as a leader of a team myself that obviously has people and their imperfections like you've talked about. And I also love seeing that too. Is it something that can be forced? Is it something that you have to let sit and settle? Do you have to nudge it in the right way? If so, how do you do that? What have you learned in achieving that, I guess, and getting to that point of synergy? Because whilst there are also wonderful people, they're also not, and, and, and there's all these other things. So what do you, what, what have you learned, I think, in, in achieving that? I'm always mindful that it's useful for people to hear interesting perspectives rather than just, you know, what might sound like the regurgi- <laughs> regurgitated obvious points. Um, and they're genuinely not in my case. I, I will try and answer it, this question as best as I can. I think a, a leader's role is probably threefold. I think, first of all, you need to set the right direction. Uh, it, you know, ultimately, leadership is about, are there, you know, are there certain objectives? Are there key goals that you can get people to rally around? And that's particularly important when there's a lot going on, right? Somebody at some point, they don't need to be the most experienced, the smartest necessarily, but they need to try and be very clear 
uh, in their own thinking and in galvanizing the thinking of others around them to really say, look, these are the three key things that we're going to try and achieve over this period of time. And when we try and then come to prioritizing or making difficult decisions about what to, which customer to pursue or what product to develop further, we have to then be able to anchor back to those objectives, those goals that we set. To me, that's you know role number one. Role number two, though, is also creating the right environment for achieving those goals. And that becomes a function of, I think, helping to coordinate the resource base, which again starts with the people, but really, you know, the 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 entire resource base at, at that organization's disposal, where I think um you know, it's really important to also then push down the responsibilities and accountabilities for making that uh, environment as productive as possible. So you start with the goals and objectives, and then you're almost pushing into the key results. I'm a big, I'm a big fan of the OKR framework. And I think when it comes to then, you know, how do you execute against those goals and objectives? It's Thinking again as 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 critically and clearly as possible about what are the resources that we absolutely need, and then the third role of a leader, I think, is that you need to be the permanent cheerleader of the team. So you you really have to think about um, how how do I keep people excited um, um, about you know achieving these goals, and also how do I lead. By, by example. So how do I actually show everybody what I think this team should look and feel like? Uh, and that, and that, that, that includes, by the way, you know, how far do I stray into the doing versus the managing? And, you know, that's a challenge I've had all my career. It being candid, I, I think that, you know, that line between setting the direction and creating the environment and empowering people to get it done Versus also just stepping in and getting it done, particularly for smaller organizations, particularly in uncertain situations, is is not always easy to manage. No, it's a very difficult line to walk that. But I think, especially in the early days of starting a company, I think it is obviously incredibly necessary because you are setting culture, aren't you? You and the, whatever they say, depending on what you read, but the first five people into any organization are going to set culture and, and you are obviously a big part of that. You mentioned leading by example, almost like a, as a default, as a de facto, you have to lead by example to be a good leader. And I think many, many people would agree with you there. And I think I don't, there's not a startup founder there's not a start, single startup founder I, I know that wouldn't agree with that and wants to lead by example, but you're right. I think when you are doing the doing, finding a way to, as you, as you mention it, pushing down the accountabilities and the responsibilities after that, whilst maintaining the high standards and whilst maintaining the key delivery to the key clients and the key, like at what point do you step in? It, it is, in, it's incredibly difficult. It, it really is. But before we go too far into that, let's talk about the rest of your story. So from private equity, what happens next? Because healthcare comes in at some point, so, here, which is interesting. It does. It does. It, it comes through pretty strongly. It actually, healthcare started coming through in my banking days. So I worked a lot with pharma companies uh, who, were, uh, who were doing things, particularly in the US. So I was based in Europe, but I would... Uh, uh, be traveling with them to do things, for instance, in the States when they were buying and selling parts of themselves. And I really enjoyed learning uh, at that part of my career about how these global pharmacos were working. Um, and 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 I, again, actually, the, the high caliber of the professionals in those, uh, in those companies, I met very many people who really cared about uh, the difference that they thought their products were making uh, to patients in the real world. One of my one of my uh, seminal deals was uh, was Bayer Biological Products, which which became Telecris, which was actually a great success for the private equity backers. Um, but more importantly, I think was offering uh, life changing treatments to people uh, with a, with a range of diseases, and that I found fascinating. How actually that could coexist, right? So financially, it made a lot of sense, but also. 
for people who really had a need for those products, it was making a difference every day. So I, I, I kind of started falling in love with healthcare at that point. When I then moved into private equity uh, initially with Goldman Sachs, which was very much at the kind of large cap, you know, big company end of the spectrum, uh, there was a little bit of exposure to healthcare, um, but it was a very um, uh, kind of uh, multi-industry role. And I found that uh, that part was actually missing a bit. So I, I, I seized upon every opportunity to look at, at life science and healthcare opportunities, which I then started receiving in spades uh, when I joined the founding team of Vitruvian Partners, which has now grown to be uh, quite a global growth equity firm. So I was I was lucky to be there from from pretty much the beginning, um, and um, and I was also lucky to to lead the healthcare franchise for. Vitruvian. So over the past, uh, by now, I guess, uh, 15 plus years, that's been a very, very large part of my life. Um, And we were very fortunate, I think, to be able to back some really, really interesting, um, usually high growth enterprises, both on the healthcare side and on the life science oriented side. So what, what I guess we uh, we were able to do ever more is is identify and then back um, uh, organizations with uh, with interesting technology and services geared either towards industry players like pharma companies or contract research organizations or uh, also um, also the health system itself. So whether that was hyper growth uh, uh, companies like Signant Health, which was led by one of now FitFile's non-executive directors, Rachel Wiley, or innovative tech pioneers like Ada Health out of Berlin, uh, or even organizations in need of more fundamental shakeups like Sciences, which used to be known as Healthcare at Home, uh, which is is today a leading pharma services company that has that has moved into unlocking the full potential of its rich patient interfaces and the rich data that it has access to as well that really got me ever more involved in that world so it's it's really a big spectrum of of companies uh a lot of them based in uk and europe but also some of them more globally and certainly with a with a global remit that got me that got me ever deeper into the world of of healthcare and and life sciences but you know for me james um uh that was always against the backdrop of a more general role that i was uh, playing across Vitruvian um, uh, with respect to technology and data. So a lot of the other businesses that that we were backing were companies like Just Eat and Skyscanner and Farfetch and Trustpilot and, you know, kind of really interesting European unicorns uh, that were created um, over the years. And that also taught me a lot about generally best practice about how uh, how these marketplaces could be created, how technology and data could actually really make make a big difference in those other sectors, which we then, whilst at Vitruvian, were applying into the healthcare space and certainly something that I've been taking with me now into the building of FitFile. There's something coming through for me here, actually, which is you're talking a lot about and gravitating towards this this notion of high performance, I, I, I feel like you really respect that in people and in teams and broadening out again and in organizations. And it seems that your nature is to be drawn towards and what you want to see of all of those different groups is high performance. And it seems like the way that your currency for that is data because what better way to find and seek high performance in any team or organization more broadly than data? It, it, seems, it seems that that's where this kind of passion lives, right? It seems like this is where perhaps FitFile came from, which is this, the, the, the seeking uh, of high performance and the most high performance. And I suppose you could call that efficiency savings and this, that, but that almost seems more negatively framed and more kind of, I don't know, lesser framed, I guess, than the than the the everlasting search for high performance. I don't know if, if that relates. It does. I, I think if I ever needed a shrink, James, maybe I would come <laughs> to you because you're reading, you're you're reading me quite well, uh, <laughs> and I think you make an excellent point. I, I I really do think you're you're right because to me it it it's not the pursuit of profit. Okay, it's not it's not about as you say something. 
you know, addressing a negative failure. It is the fact that it, it, if there is a, a potential to a person or an organization, I get tremendous joy out of seeing that potential unlocked. And, 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 and I love it when others do as well. And, and as you say, well, how can you actually know what the true art of the possible is? How can you measure that as well? How can you keep improving on it if you haven't got the data? And that is why I have been so excited to build out FitFile over the last few years, because in healthcare, as we both know, there is so much latent value to data everywhere that is currently locked up that it's absolutely a tragedy right it is it is so obvious yes. if you look at any studies and there've been plenty right at at different scales it is so obvious how data driven decision making will make things on average better that when you leave this data lying around and by the way this is not because people don't understand it or or, or they're against it it's just as we'll, we can talk about, you know, it, it, it's, a, it's a feature of the system, right, that, that has lots of different uh, people with different motivations with, frankly, often too little time uh, to actually do something about the state that we're in. That means that actually today, I think we need more people, we need more organizations like FitFile to really work together uh, to finally unlock that and to absolutely unleash that potential mm. so so you're right that's generally my my ethos um people that know me back even from uni days by the way where i was always a bit of a nutter i think know that i used to get very cross particularly with my my smarter friends when i could see them lounging around in bed rather than going to lectures or doing something else with their lives so this is you, you are you are hitting the nail on the head i'm afraid mm. it, it's a bugbear <laughs> of mine it's it's what i tell my children as well you know i don't care i don't yes. look down on anybody Right. I think yes. if you do the best you can, that's all anybody could ever ask of you. That's all you should ask of yourself. But okay. if you're not doing the best, if you're not trying to use what's available to really make the most of that of that situation, that's a that's a waste and it's a shame. Yeah, there's definitely this this thing in you about the 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 frustration at the unrealized potential versus the joy of that potential being realized and seeing that high performance. It, it, it's so unbelievably clear. And I guess what comes along with that at the organization level is value. And it goes back to what, what we talked about at the very start of this podcast, which is that there is just so much to be done to allow healthcare to become digital. And the collection of this data is incredibly important, a hugely important part of that. Because as you say, you only have to look around an intensive care unit and, and you just have to look and listen to all the beeps and all of the things going on and the people interactions and the conversations and the monitors and everything together that just isn't being collected in any meaningful way. And if it's not being collected in any meaningful way, it's not being connected in any meaningful way, it's not being unified in any meaningful way, it's not being tested on in any meaningful way. So... There's so there's so much to be done there from an infrastructure perspective that it it I'm with you and I think when you when you combine that with your personal passion for obviously the the uh, the, the seeking of the uh, high performance linking us together I, th I think it's a it, it's a, a fascinating combination to launch a company so on that note tell me about Fitfile tell me about the inception of Fitfile the idea for Fitfile where it practically came from and yeah, I guess the 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 beginnings of that. What's the product? How did you put the MVP together? Talk about the early days of Fitfile. Yeah, so Fitfile is really about solving one of the two key challenges that I think stand in the way of using data more efficiently, more safely, and at much greater scale. the The first challenge that we continue to see but that I think is being overcome is, is one of interoperability. So historically, obviously, we had lots of different systems, lots of different uh, data models as well, um, if you can even call them that, because I think it was just sort of randomly cobbled together data schema. Increasingly, with the advent of APIs, with um, transfer standards like FHIR, with coding like SNOMED and ICD, uh, or OMOP even as well from a research perspective. You know, all of those issues, I think, James, are are, are, are 
definitely much easier to 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 navigate than they used to be so so we at fitfar are less concerned with that certainly our solution is able to engage with any kind of data in any sort of environment um you know bring in anything from a database feed through an api or even a lowly csv or excel file upload uh, we can deal with all of that because often you need to in the healthcare system <laughs> but what we really really are solving is the privacy challenge um, and we we are big believers in the need to protect each of our privacy. Uh, and we think that uh, having a spectrum of privacy treatment in order to do that is really critical. So, of course, there are situations, as you were saying earlier, where there is a clinician in, in a clinical setting and they have a patient and they need to have access to identifiable data in order to be able to diagnose and treat that individual. Now, even there, as as, as many listeners I'm sure will know, uh, there are severe issues with having access to the right data quickly enough to support those clinical decisions. That is something which we are helping with more in near real time um, in terms of, for example, uh, the, the sort of weekly management group meetings, understanding patient cohorts more on an ongoing basis. But it's certainly something that the fit file technology has been designed to do. If you move from identifiable into some level of privacy protection, uh, today's state of the art typically uh, tends to be viewed as pseudonymization or tokenization at source. Now, pseudonymization is, of course, the replacement of uh, uh, personal identifiers with unchanging artificial identifiers. So, for example, uh, Philip becomes XYZ16C and he will always be XYZ16C. And in that way, nobody knows that it's really Philip. Um, if you're looking at XYZ16C, and you can also then critically link data from one source with that from another source. And that's what's used normally today by health systems, by industry. The problem is that that's reversible in the eyes of the law. So under the UK GDPR, the GDPR more generally, if you look at ICO guidance, uh, uh, if you look at common law, that is still deemed to be personal data. And that means that there is, of course, a risk associated with that, which uh, which is not small because somebody somewhere can change XYZ16C back into Philip. But it also means that you need to be very, very careful, and we believe rightly so, in terms of the legal basis that you have for looking at that data. So if you're thinking about planning or particularly research, you need to either have um, consent from the individuals involved or you need to have in the UK what's known as Section 251 support, for example, uh, or, or you need to find some other reason for you looking at that data. And what that means in practice, there was a really interesting uh, article uh, in the European Journal of Human Genetics a couple of years ago where they, where they talk about the impact this has on the secondary use of data. And it's really, really significant because... In practice, the cost of getting people's consent can can run into something like three, four hundred pounds per consent, which should be gotten per purpose, and that purpose cannot be unlimited in time, and 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 that means that actually that's quite prohibitive when you want to look at large large scale data, but it also means that actually even when you've done that, people often shy away from using that data as fully as as they ideally would because they're just worried about doing something wrong. So the FitFile platform can offer this because there are, of course, use cases where people will say, well, look, I just want to be able to reverse it and I have the right legal basis. So please, can we do that? And we say, no problem. But what FitFile has developed are two key innovations that otherwise do not exist anywhere else. And we've done that very much by design on purpose. The first of which is that we can irreversibly anonymize at source and still unite across sources. So our anonymization protocol goes beyond what I've described, the pseudonymization, because we will, in an entirely multi-stage random way, allocate a unique alphanumeric ID, which is the longest in any industry anywhere in the world, which changes every time you run the process so that there is no reversibility, there is no risk to privacy, um, and therefore under the GDPR and other regimes around the world, you then don't need to worry about getting consent or some other legal basis. You can use that data as you need to. But what we have built also then allows for the 
linking of data across sources. So we use fairly sophisticated um, cryptography, uh, which is effectively an asymmetric set of mathematical calculations to establish whether in any other data sources, the individuals there also exist somewhere else in the world. And that's how we can link the data. We then run another anonymization protocol once we bring that data together to to absolutely make sure that there is no reasonable risk of re-identification. And in that way, we can finally serve up the kind of complete health profiles at the sort of scale that's required to really be able to say, this is the whole population. These are the stratified cohorts of interest versus some other cohorts that might be comparator groups, for example. And we can really unlock the true power of that data because we can then say for any source, these are the critical data elements that we really must look at. And they might be, you know, a hospital record plus a primary care record plus some activity metrics plus maybe some patient reported outcomes plus some socioeconomic aspects, which is really important, right? Because we know for most conditions, 50 to 60 percent of health outcome determinants have their data accumulating in non-clinical silos. And that's the data that's normally particularly difficult to get to. With our technology, we have made that so much more feasible. The second key innovation that we believe nobody else has, certainly not in combination with anonymization at source, is what we call computation at source. So we don't even need to move the data records in anonymized form from each source. We can do local calculations on those populations. And we can do the same in other data sources, knowing with full confidence that those calculations relate to the same populations. So what we can actually finally facilitate at scale is what everybody, of course, wants with the data minimization principle, which you'll know, which is properly federated analytics. So we can establish for subpopulations of interest across sources in fully anonymized form what's going on with them. We can say in data source one, these are their BMI attributes. In data source two, we can say these are some of their HbA1c statistics. And in data source three, we can say these are their activity metrics. And maybe in data source D, we can look at hospitalization. And in that way, we can create these very rich profiles on those populations without moving any single piece of identifiable personal data. It sounds, it sounds incredible, fascinating, all of the above. I've got, so my first, I guess, point is obviously what you're doing is you're taking, you're taking all this data that exists. And first of all, what you talked about, uh, solving for interoperability, solving for privacy. It's interesting that you put those things first because actually you must be well aware of, of any time you mention data and healthcare that there's an immediate, what are you doing with it? Who are you doing it for? What's it going to be used for? Is it private? Is it, that, but you've, you're addressing that up front, which I think is interesting that actually not only that you're, you're actually solving for that. Like you know that it's a problem and actually that's the first big thing to tackle. So all this usability and potential high performance stuff that we can do afterwards actually is not even close to unlocked if we're not addressing this very large and relevant problem of first of all privacy and then interoperability and actually what you talked about both what you do at source what you do across you know it, it, it relates to that but I think that's a really just interesting way of framing it, that actually not only are you taking it in into consideration, you're actually solving for it. You see that clearly as a barrier to the appropriate use of data. So therefore, it does need solving as, as a key part of this. So it becomes actually part of the product. It's not it's not something you consider. It's a, it is actually the product and privacy is part of the product. So that's interesting to me. The other thing that's interesting to me, so my question was going to be for who to do what. And actually, you started to address that later on when you pulled all this together, actually, that it's it's actually across healthcare. this. You talked about hospital records. You talked about primary care stuff. You talked about patient reported outcomes. You talked about very individual level patient stuff, you know, blood results, HbA1c, you know, that the amount, the, just the volume of platforms that you're you're talking about being across here. 
is ambitious to a to the nth degree you know because actually what you then talked about right at the end you talk about pulling all of this together and for want of a better phrase uniting it the word that you used that actually the unifying hospital records patient reported outcomes gp records blood results activity metrics to your point, the population level data that you unlock, it's almost sort of overwhelming, actually, for me to even think about, like, what the, what, what could you actually end up doing with all that data? Because you, as you say, you can, you can look, you, you can filter it for certain demographics and look at what, look at that stuff. You can, like, any, anything becomes possible. So I will come back to that question, though, for some specifics of case studies here, because for who to do what, I think. So for whom is this for? Who is the buyer of this? And what's the value that the buyer then unlocks? So I think it's important, as you say, to be mindful of not trying to boil the ocean. Yeah. Right? So this is not about suddenly making every data point for every condition, for every human on earth, available and unifiable right that's <laughs> not that's not yet our ambition uh, not yet um but what it what it does come down to is is i think um what you are helpfully reflecting is what i believe needs to happen which is enough coordination and collaboration between the stakeholders in the health system to stop reinventing the wheel when it comes to accessing and using data. Mm. So our platform has been, as you say, designed in the way that it has to serve different stakeholders, because I think that's what needs to happen in order to unlock this otherwise <laughs> pretty un unlockable Gordian knot of who's going to look at data when and pay for it, et cetera. So to be more specific, we see three key applications which is not novel because they're pretty obvious ones. There's the health planning. There's the health care that links into that health planning and there's health research. And then there is, of course, people who are interested in planning care and research and the uh, customer groups that an entity like FitFile has, therefore, include the health systems themselves, again, by design, because we want our platform to be useful and usable and of some value to the health system that they're happy to pay for, for planning purposes, for example. But it's also designed to, of course, serve up the best quality, largest scale data for research purposes, for instance, for industry researchers. And this is not to then sell lotions and potions to people. This is for bona fide research, clinical trials or, or real-world evidence studies, for example, where at the moment, as I think most of us now know, particularly driven by COVID and how that showed it, right? You, you had, for example, the recovery study for dexamethasone, which I think people are comfortable saying probably helped at least save 1 million lives around the world. That was actually a real-world evidence study. That was done in the field, in the moment, on real people. And it showed, mm -hmm. I think, the art of the possible mm -hmm. around bringing this data together. So I, and, and look, who benefited, right? Of course, all of us as, as individuals, as humans, as citizens, but also that was used, actually, some of that data was used by governments. It obviously helped think about how do you, how do you offer products and so forth. So it's, it's an interesting example of the same data being accessed efficiently, being united, very helpfully serving different purposes. Mm. If you are a healthcare planner and you're trying to understand which parts of your population are most vulnerable, where are some of the health inequalities, you know, how, where are where are care pathways not working very well, you know, which which treatment plans would work better on certain kinds of of patients. Well, guess what? That is also of interest to a big pharma company that's thinking about how mm. to optimize their R&D programs, how to think about where the best re responders for their product sit. So we absolutely see a very helpful, um, a very helpful overlap in interests between the health systems, between uh, the life science industry, and then to be handled absolutely with caution, because we understand and we agree with people's reservations around this. There is then also the 
pay or, or reimbursement side. So one of the things that we believe in, and this goes to our earlier conversation already, James, uh, is that resources are, of course, constrained um, in, in optimizing healthcare provision. Uh, and we would really like to help make the allocation of those resources uh, as effective as possible to help the largest number of people in the fairest possible way. And we think that that is something that we need to embrace. It, you know, it, it carries with it, of course, a lot of challenges. But again, having more data to hand to make better informed decisions about where uh, where those resources can be deployed, we think is a good thing. So we see health systems and and the life science industry as our key customers. We would also really, in a in a, in a careful, aggregated, anonymized way, like to help with making the the most uh, efficient and effective resource allocation decisions as well. It's really interesting. Um, you guys did a webinar recently, and, and I believe there was a, a an NHS gastroenterologist that works with you around you that talked about specific use i mean how, how is this used but for someone like that how is this useful for an nhs gastroenterologist what's the what what's the use to them is it that that department can then see what's in you know going to come through their outpatients and they can figure out what's going on in the community is it broader than that what talk to me about that as a specific use case the fit file solution is very helpful for clinicians and I would argue the administrators um, for the organizations that they're part of, because what we've already seen through that case study, which was at, at St. George's Hospital, we've seen it with, with other hospitals, actually, that um, even within those hospital settings, as an example, typically there will be somewhere between 30 to 60 different systems of record right around some of the diagnostics around the administrative data, around health records, mm -hmm. you know, and that's just within that environment. And the example that you mentioned, actually, there had been years of effort. I think it was three or four years that the clinicians had asked for certain kinds of data to be brought together. And that proved impossible with the existing tools that they had. With our platform, it actually became very simple to bring together the critical data elements of interest from across those sources and serve them up to that team of clinicians so that they could actually see much more easily than they've been able to after years of trying what was going on with their patients. And we've seen that not just in that, in that hospital, but we've seen it for different conditions in other care settings where, where also, you know, it's not just about is it possible, it's also the effort that's required. And we have today, as we all know, a very, very long waiting list. We have very, very overworked um, uh, nurses, doctors, you know, admin staff. And frankly, they're wasting way too much time on trying to pull together spreadsheets, multi Microsoft Access databases, outdated uh, EHR systems. And we have done already projects where with our platform, we can have very efficiently assembled dashboards that do not require any of this valuable time, which could be deployed towards helping patients on pulling together those data. So, so they find very much that not only are they, are they able to devote more time uh, to improving those outcomes, uh, but they also have higher quality data to be able to, in their minds, make more confident decisions. So that's very much at the care clinician end of the spectrum, James. This is what we were talking about right at the start and what I mentioned right at the start, which was that I'm having this reflection at the minute that is, is digital health, the things, the techie things that go in to solve problems or is, is digital health actually this infrastructure that allows clinicians to do what they've always done which is look at data and make good decisions about the quality of care. And using that, using that as an example and just thinking that through, you think of that gastroenterology department that now has that longitudinal view of all their patients and what's gone on. You're equipping very smart people to, to, okay, to, to bring another point in, you, this high performance point. You're equipping a group of incredibly talented individuals and experienced individuals, you're now equipping them with more information to make decisions. And so 
Let's think about the clinical output and the clinical benefit that to those patients that will happen as a result of this infrastructure change. If you think about the fact that they might set up different clinics in different ways that are far more streamlined and stratified where everyone's practicing at the top of their license. They might have a stoma nurse developer clinic. They might have uh, this to it like that. They might have loads of different things set up. So now care is reorganized and, and more efficient, more high performance. Let's just say that is, an, is one output. Well, there are probably lots and lots and lots of companies trying to do that in different ways. But this feels like it solves the problem in a more deep way, that actually the infrastructure's changed and now the people that already exist in healthcare are equipped to create these different solutions that are already possible without any AI machine learning technology. I don't know, if, you know, I use that kind of in jest, but like, do you know what I mean? Like we're not, we're not talking about a large language model chat bot that's now going to triage everybody into different things. And you need to give this new bit of tech out to the community to make these things happen. We're actually talking about more of a change that, that other things can be layered onto. And actually even in the short term, these clinicians that already know how to solve a lot of these problems, they don't just have the information and now give, being given more information. It's a garbled way of putting it, I think, from me there. But like, I, I just, I just feel like, what are the, what are the solutions that this is going to lead to? What's the impact this is going to lead to for those people specifically? And how many other ways are different organisations and people trying to get that same impact through different means? This is just a different way of doing it, but perhaps more long term. I don't know. I don't know if, I don't know if that kicks any reflections off with you. Uh, it, it definitely does, James. I, I think, to me, um, it's a bit of both. I think there are some really strong digital health point solutions that have emerged mm. over the years. I, I think mm. when you look at some of the tech-enabled patient support programs, you look at some of the you know digital therapeutics, mm. DTX, I, I know you mentioned pair. It's very unfortunate that they went, went, went how they went, and they were not the first. But you know, there are other solutions like Achille, for example, which I've tracked for a long time that I really like in terms of treating uh, neurological conditions um, in, in the pediatric domain using computer games, right? And I think there is a future for that, as strange as it sounds. But but you know, for me, a lot of that digital health side of the equation hasn't quite got to yet where it should go because it actually more often than not has lacked the evidence to support its properly rolled out use and, and reimbursement. Uh, and, and it doesn't matter. You know, I've talked to some of the insurers in, in Germany who are obviously in the, in the vanguard of the DIGA movement there in terms of reimbursement. And they, and they complain about, you know, having to pay out several hundred euros just for somebody downloading an app, not even opening it. And, and they're crying out for better evidence. I've talked to some of the bigger digital uh, therapeutics providers in the UK who complain that it's all a little bit sort of unclear how they can actually get paid properly because they're not able to submit data that hasn't been collected kind of in a, in a sufficiently uh, approved way. So I think a lot of the digital health side of things, exactly as you say, needs to be better supported by the health tech side of, of, of things. Mm. So I kind of, I, I see a slight difference there. I don't know how much others would agree with that, but I think health tech to me is a broader definition around, for instance, also the kind of stuff that Fitfile is doing, where it is about, as you say, the infrastructure. It's definitely not the glamorous end of the spectrum, no, right? I mean, I, I get excited <laughs> about data science aspects that I think other people will find pretty boring pretty quickly. That's okay. Um, you know, it's nice to geek out on some of that stuff uh, every now and then, but it's critical, right? It's really, really critical, as you say, to harness not just the data that's already there, but also the resources that are already there, because we all know how difficult it is to change the way that things are being done in healthcare. There's a lot of legitimate reasons for people to be risk averse, patient safety being first and foremost, of course, the key consideration we need to always keep in mind. But it's also a way of doing things, right? If I'm honest about what I've seen across sectors, my, my big plea to everybody that I come across is say, yes, I would be the first to be worried about the downsides. Yes, I would be the first to be maybe a bit Germanic and wanting to put in place protections against those downsides. But I also hope to be one of the first to say, yes, okay, but now we've done that, let's charge ahead, right? Let's actually, let's actually use what we have 
let's not get seduced by the latest, you know, potential chat GPT type thing that could at some point be useful. Let's think about the here and now. Let's embrace the technology that's available, that's proven. Let's use the people we have and, and, and make things better. So that's why I'm saying, James, to me, it's a combination of how can we optimize what we already have in that performance quest, but also how can we evaluate efficiently and, and actually comprehensively some of these new ways of working. And that's where I have seen, um, again, with some of the work we're also doing with, with people who are developing biomarkers and so forth, real frustration in terms of getting access to enough data, getting access to enough real world kind of volume, if you like, to really show, okay, for this particular digital health product, these are the outcomes for the individuals on that versus a sufficiently large and consistently tracked comparator group that can really show the relative uh, the relative benefits, both in terms of, of course, safety, ticking that box, but also actually the the outcomes and the value of those outcomes. Mm. Yeah, I, I get asked quite a lot for what's exciting me in, in health tech at the minute. I guess I ask this on panels and various bits and bobs, like what's exciting? And I always say the same thing, which is like just something that works. And it's a strange answer because people will often VR this, AR that, like the AI this, large language model that. Like it's, it, it's, it's easy to get excited by technologies, I think, when they are at the front end very aesthetic and pleasing in all of those regards and what they can do and, and all these different things. I think what actually excites me, though, is this sort of stuff. And the reason it does, I think, is because, as many people know on this podcast, I bang on about this all the time, but I, I was a doctor on the front line and I empathize massively with those that are. And part of your frustration is always being spread too thin and not being able to deliver a standard of care that you want to. And again, it's not a sexy problem to solve. And where um where startups and companies and, and lots of digital health and health tech and all sorts comes in and tries to save an hour here or there doing this that and the other it, it's difficult for me to get excited because i understand the practicalities or lack thereof behind that because really what does that actually do other than squeeze you a bit more i think where it comes to big infrastructure changes that can genuinely start to redefine how people work I think that really does get me excited because it gets me thinking that you can reorganize care. It gets me thinking that you can allow people to practice at the top of license. And even when you talk about the role of industry and the role of all these different organizations that can benefit from this unified data that's across all of these different sources, you start to see and you start to, well, I anyway, start to genuinely think about how healthcare could actually really change. It's not about just putting a technology in that will do a thing. To your point, point solutions, right? It And it is that in some regard. And I can completely accept that. I, heck, you know, I'm in health tech, you know, 300 of them on this podcast that we, we've, we've spoken to. Yes, everyone knows that I like those point solutions. But my mind at the moment is now moving to, if we can't make a big infrastructure change that's going to really support all of this stuff, and to your point about evidence and 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 those point solutions need that. Those point solutions need a place that they can be interoperable with everything. Those point solutions need more from the infrastructure. If we're going to get growth and scale, dare I say that word, to support VC-backed businesses, which is what we badly need, because if they are going to scale in the UK, they can go to the US and return those VCs some money. But we need to prove that in the UK. So we need this ability for things to scale. I don't know, man, like my mind is just is just moving to this infrastructure thing, which is why I, th I think this is this is more exciting for me. It's, it's the reason I used to come on this podcast. I, 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 want, I want to learn more about this. I want to know what's going to be possible. And this, this does excite me, this stuff. It really does. Um, and it's, it's never going to be an answer that I give to the next journalists that ask me, like, um, more infrastructure, <laughs> more, more, more empty pipes that well, do stuff. I mean, like, if, it's, if it's you think about it, right. What, yeah. What, what is infrastructure about? I, I think you make excellent points uh, to me. 
the point of infrastructure, a road from A to B is, yeah. is closing the gap. And I think what we're discussing here is how can you close multiple gaps? First of all, how can you close the gap between data silos, right? And, and mm -hmm. that's really important. But also, to your points, how can you close the gap between what's happening every day, you know, in the field at the, at the sharp end, right, in terms of doctors dealing with patients and the information that they have available with what information the planners see and with what information the researchers mm. see. So it's also about that gap. It's also then about the gap between each of those entities and, and how can we make sure that they can work together and share the data between themselves and look at the same data. So I am personally really excited about mm. some of the UK initiatives that have been driven now for a few years by HDR UK, for example. I really love this whole uh, emphasis now on secure data environments and the work that's being put into that um, to really try to harmonize, you know, what data is being looked at, how it's being collected and all that. I think it's a great idea to see whether the federated data platform in the UK can actually help feed that. Maybe it will, maybe it won't. It doesn't matter, right? It's still the right sort of movement towards actually trying to coordinate some of this. And then across Europe more broadly, I think the European health data space, it still feels very far away, but at least there's a growing number of people who are putting together some of the historical initiatives like Darwin and H2O and so forth into, into a framework where you can actually start to bring each of these stakeholders together and start to build and refine this infrastructure, as you say, so that actually it does provide the right backdrop, unsexy as it is, for 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 then you know in a, in a coordinated way pushing forward in terms of better practice and better evaluation mm. of, of of practices. And I think that's where Europe, in particular, uh, you know, has an opportunity ultimately with the GDPR to potentially help set the tone. Globally, in the US, I think it's great to see some of the data networks, some of the data privacy players as well, having grown quite rapidly. But we are seeing and we're hearing as well uh, from a lot of um, uh, industry and regulated type players that there is a growing eye towards better protection of individuals' privacy because HIPAA is acknowledged as having some 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 potential weaknesses in terms of looking after people's privacy and and, and the latest proposed. I think American Data Protection Act, albeit for the retail industry, is, is setting the tone at a federal level. And I think within mm. the states, you're also seeing some mm. of that. So I think this is a, you know, this infrastructure point you're making, um, the chance to really lead something, something special here out of the UK, out of Europe, is really exciting. I love that. A um, couple of questions before I let you go. What's your biggest challenge at the moment in growing Fitfile. Um, whereabouts are you guys at and what are you looking to do in the near future? So we have uh, deployed in uh, a number of private and uh, public settings, I guess. The platform, we've got uh, examples of the system actually working, being scalable um, in, in kind of environments that have underlying patient populations of about 6 billion people. We've got all the accreditations you could want. We have a, a very strong team that's that's growing. But the biggest obstacle remains that we see more often than we'd like huge, I guess, theoretical endorsement. And, and, and I can't tell you how often we've heard words like, this is the holy grail. This is gold <laughs> dust. This is exactly <laughs> what we've needed all these years. Let's go. Let's do it. And then nothing happens. Uh, and, you know, other priorities come in. You know, we get we get bogged down in in endless processes in in in, in just too much, uh, I think, um, lack of progress. Um, yeah. and, and, and there are many reasons why that why that's the case. But, you know, in terms of the biggest challenge, as you said, by far and above, it's the biggest challenge. We've got smart people. We have a product that works. We've proven that it's safe. Uh, we, we've actually got a great, what we call the navigator, uh, uh, which helps us kind of get through governance and so forth. Um, but it, it's just that attitudinal shift, which I'm hoping mm -hmm. will continue to come through because there are, there are a growing number of people, I'm happy to say, who um, I think are not quite so in the mindset of, well, unless we've talked to you for two years, we can't possibly say yes mm -hmm. uh, uh, faster than that. There are, there are more people now who are not like that. 
Uh, and to me, you know, we just we just mustn't give up. All of those of us who get the need for this improved infrastructure, who get the need to pull together the data, just have to keep going. We have to win more advocates and we have to get this groundswell movement properly, mm. properly into takeoff and mm. beyond. I love it. So for those organizations that are in planning, care and research, um, what is your ask to them? What types of organizations are you looking to get in touch with or sh- who should get in touch with you, basically? Who's the, who are we calling to action here? So we're calling to action certainly those organizations who already have access to data but understand that they really should bring that data together more effectively and also combine that data with other sources still. So that can include the existing data aggregators. Uh, you know, Again, that it, it could be people who are already collecting data on behalf, for example, of underlying health systems. Uh, it could be industry players. Um, it could be health plans who understand that we can't use that data to discriminate against individuals, but we can use it to improve the services they offer. Uh, for example, so it is you know it is about um, at scale health systems. It is about data aggregators. It is about um, again bona fide industry players uh, who who want to do better things with data um, and who have access to some of that data. You know, we faced since the beginning a huge chicken and egg problem because a lot of people will say, "Well, what data have you got?" And we say, "Well, unless we." have enough data, we can't then serve it up to you and we can't get the data unless we have some demand. So there is that that fly which we're luckily, you know, getting through, but we're still in the early stages of. And yeah. one of the ways that we're trying to make sure that we can get that off the ground is that we have certain clinical areas of interest as well. So we're particularly keen on the cardiovascular space, um, oncology, you mentioned earlier gastroenterology, for example. Um, we, we tend to be more focused on some of the the chronic and higher impact conditions where we know that we will really be able to make a difference um, to, uh, of course, first and foremost, the individuals with those conditions, but also the health systems who are, who are spending a lot of their, of their scarce resources and, of course, to, to industry who, who may or may not be interested in those sectors. Awesome. Um, Philip, it's been an absolute pleasure having you on. Um, I've, I do feel like I've learned a great deal, actually. I think... Yeah, it's it's definitely given me a lot more food for thought on um, certainly on this infrastructure piece and how to actually explain that so that it doesn't sound incredibly dull. So that's quite nice. Um, but also, I yeah, your your uh, your search for high performance and and doing that through data and and allowing clinicians to make good decisions and allowing organisations to make good decisions on the back of data is is clearly clearly a quest worth going on. So. Um, all the best to you if people want to get in touch with you to learn more about fitfile uh what's the best way for them to do so well of course i'm on on all the modern channels james but you know email is still uh, is still a, an effective way um to get in touch i'm on philip.rossmeyer at fitfile.com if that's too tricky contact at fitfile.com also works awesome thank you so much for joining me